uh, it will not because you are not spending in terms of infrastructure or time. What you are, uh, what you are paying is only for that duration for which you are engaging. Them. So even if they are coming and spending only few hours with you for learning, you are not paying them. You are paying them when they are delivered. Right? So that is uh, that is something how you structure your engagement or how complex your engagement is. Based on that, you will know how much it costs. What are the challenges that you face? First and biggest challenge is perception. Uh, people still feel that crowd is over. It's, it's, uh, it's something like off offshoring in the 90s. Uh, even now, if you look at some European countries, offshoring is still seen with the same kind of a taboo. Crowd test, crowdsourcing is still seen very, very insecure, especially when, it, when people uh, in enterprise say, what happens to my IP? And of course, up to a certain extent, you can protect and talk about all, all things that you do. I'll talk about some things like NDAs, this and that. But eventually, after a certain point, there is a risk. Right? You are opening up your application to an unknown person. No matter how many NDAs he might have signed with you or contract he might have signed with you, he is, in the end, uh, he can do what he wants to do. Right? So, so is it very popular right now? Or is it, it is an emerging industry, I would say. It is something that is uh, gaining prominence a lot in the US market, uh, because that is the one where adaptation starts first. And a lot of uh, companies are talking about, because as I said, BYOD, cloud, freelancing, all that is sort of moving towards something. So what I personally believe is that maybe in, in, in a future there would be a central pool of freelancers. There would be different organizations who maintain their own bench, right? And this bench is currently 70% uh, 30% is a bench and 70% is what they are operating with. They might reduce that 30% to say a 10%. And those people will move into this central pool of freelancers. Every organization will have their own employee base. And plus, they can have access through some form of technology to a community, and then the technology and their processes will their processes will drive the value when they're delivering to the customer, not just the community. So, community will become a commodity that will be available to everybody, and there will be a skilled pool of different kind of skills in the center. That is what is discussion in a lot of companies and organizations are thinking about, but still a lot of it is still on paper. But uh, some of the use cases are very well adapted and very well suited. So we are doing projects for companies that are doing drive testing. In different countries, they are coming up with some applications which require you know, some kind of real, real field testing. So there, this adaptation is very quick. So most of the mobile web space, the adaptation is quick, especially for compatibility, usability, and these kind of unique scenarios. Network testing, uh, identifying if an application is behaving fine. Uh, Voice quality checks. These are things that a lot of you know uh, problems have been faced in the past. There have been customer complaints, and then through this kind of real world testing, you can cover them. Another question here. Uh, so I like the lifecycle diagram you had. Um, there was a stage so after you collected the testers and they have uh, started doing the testing. You consolidate the report and then you pay the tester. Right? Um, yeah. So if I just map it to something more traditional, which is the user acceptance testing. Uh, you may end up opening the uh, product to, let's say, six or seven uh, business stakeholders. Uh, even with such a small number, uh, the, team, the team struggles to consolidate the bug, uh, bug reports. So there will be a lot of duplicate reports. Um, and here there's a final financial implication as well. If it's an outcome-based uh, payment, uh, then one defect, you may end up uh, spending a lot paying each tester who actually found it independently. So how, how do you deal with this consolidation of so, duplicate? Uh, first thing is that why that problem comes is because most of the times organizations are not ready uh, when they are within in terms of technology, uh, when they are running this kind of service. And that's why I would tell about the critical success factor and the technology plays an important role. So you need to have some central system where they can all log bugs. Okay? They can see each other's bugs. Generally, that doesn't happen when business users are doing. First of all, business users are like gods, right? They do in their own time. They'll come, they'll have two hours, they'll do the testing and they'll go. They, half the time they'll write mails that these are the bugs I found, check it out. Right? So if it has to be more structured, then it helps. So what we are also doing is some organizations, we are providing the technology to use to just help them UAT. So they can do their own UAT with their own people. They just have a central system where they can log bugs, they can see each other's bugs, and then we as an internal uh, can review what is duplicate in that lot. Of course, that duplication and removal of duplication is a big overhead. But we encourage, and that's how you have to see, the rewarding mechanism is a very strong factor in crowdsourcing. How you motivate your people to, uh, to look into certain parts for testing, do a certain types of testing, or not do a certain thing, is through rewards. Right? You tell them, you do this, we'll not pay you. You do that, we'll pay you more. 
So that way you motivate them to do certain things in a certain way. But a little bit uh, more specific, so if there are uh, duplicate reports of the same defect. Ah, so there uh, are duplicate bugs, only, first of all, every project has approximately 50 to 60 percent of uh, valid bugs. 40 percent duplicate ratio is, is, is general, ground testing. So those duplicate bugs, generally what we do is we have a managed layer of reviewers who are either some of the identified people, experts in the crowd, or internal people who clean that up. And then only the reviewed bugs are delivered back to the customer. So customer doesn't have to look into, that is the, the job of the testing team, internal teams. There has to be an involvement of internal team there. And uh, you pay only to the person who is logged the first genuine bug. You don't pay to everybody who is logging to people. And that is a known thing. Unless it is very unique to a particular compatibility feature right, uh, of, an, of a particular device. Then they are all aware about it. And that's why I said they all try to log it as soon as possible so that they are the first ones to log. And uh, you can identify on the net. There are a lot of cloud testing companies. You can join them. Uh, every company has their own way. Some companies uh, invite everybody who joins. Some company has a process of doing uh, a sort of initial sandbox phase where they analyze how com uh, you know how comfortable are you uh, with certain types of applications, how skilled are you, and then based on that they will start providing you projects once you reach a certain level. They give you points and so different organizations offer it in a different way. Okay. Uh, Quickly, on firstly, concerns and, and their mitigations. Accountability and productivity is something which is a perceived concern. I can say very clearly, it is something which is totally manageable uh, through process. So bring in managed layers, you bring in management, uh, you bring in uh, uh, a project manager who sort of, and, and reviewers who sort of select the right people, track the performance of the people, and based on that, then you make sure that only the uh, people who have been consistently performing are, are given chance to, to work on the project. So that way, uh, as I said, there is a sandbox phase where you analyze the capability of a person and then based on that you get the projects and once they are delivering on the projects, you know that yes, this person is good and you give them more opportunity. If they are not good, you don't give them multiple opportunities. And that is how you can make sure accountability is there. Uh, you stop giving people projects, you, you stop giving them money, you, they, they will make sure in future you know, they are improved and that way accountability can be maintained. Uh, the test selection process is very important because we have to select the right people to make sure that they are delivering the project. Otherwise you can bombard 50 people. I mean, in the beginning when we started crowd testing, a lot of people said, oh, put in 100 people and you know, they will find defects in one day. That doesn't happen. There will be so much duplication that you will be you know, adding a lot of overhead. So you need to have the right mix of right number of people to do crowd testing. You could put 20, 30, 40 to get the right coverage. You can't put 100, 200, 300 to just increase the number. That will add over. The other one is security and confidentiality. This is something that is a concern. And you can only, as I said, uh, tackle it up to a certain extent. Uh, beyond that, there are concepts of going into private crowd, setting up you know, selected uh, group of individuals. So you identify a pool of 30 people, 40 people, who will be dedicatedly working on specific client projects. They will be contracting with you, and then that way you can may more or less convert them into your extended employee, more like a freelance contract. But beyond that, yes, there is a risk, because every country has their own rules and regulations. You cannot, uh, sitting in India, someone sitting in Israel, and he's working for you, and if he does something, of course, there is a risk there. Right? You can't go to Israel port or any other country port to sort of sort that out. So that risk stays. And that is where we talk about bringing in private or enterprise crowd, branch, who are, if you are talking about a very sensitive project. Otherwise, more or less, I would say 70 to 80 percent of the projects are easily handled, uh, handled using the measures that can be implemented by big service providers. Uh, this is a very, very uh, important slide for me. I want to make it very, very clear that crowd testing is not a content. Because Everybody who <coughs> says crowd testing is a contest is sort of trivializing the effort that goes into crowd testing. Uh, you are building an enterprise level solution. You are building effort uh, in, into building technology, into building a community, into building processes. And then, uh, then you deliver an enterprise level professional crowd testing service. If you are only talking about uh, contest driven test, crowd testing, then you might not need all these things. You just go on Facebook and start a survey. You just sort of send Excel sheets to 20 email IDs that you might have and ask them to report your feedback 
uh, or even replying in an email, you collect it all and give it back. That's also crowdsourcing, right? So understand that when we are talking about managed crowdsourcing or managed crowdsourcing, we're talking about a professional solution which an enterprise can use, and you know, with SLA, service level agreements, uh, accountability and delivery assurance is there. And then we are talking about uh, a, a professional crowd testing. Second is a structurally developed community. So it is not, okay, you can allow anyone to be a part of the community, but you have to be very careful about bringing in diversity into your community. You cannot just have 3,000 people from one particular, say, uh, uh, these days, what, OS, uh, this Firefox OS is coming in. So you go to a community of Firefox OS, you see there are 300 people in that community, you say, write a mail to all of them, please be a part of my community. That's of no use, you just add numbers to it. You really don't need to have 400 people with that community. Right? Instead, if you had only 20 people from different kind of skill set, different kind of uh, you know uh, infrastructure or different kind of locations, that will add more value. So very structurally developed community is important. And finally, the technology is very important. How you communicate with testers, how you do a centralized bug tracking, how you do a review process, and all that has to be automated because there are large number of people involved. There is 30 people or 40 people who are testing for you with logging defects. So if you are delayed by half an hour in providing information, you are sort of uh, you know, adding a lot of garbage into your bug track. Because people would be logging defects with a known issue. And your client is coming and telling you now that there are three more known issues that we add. So the platform has to have, the technology has to be very robust to make sure that it handles all this on uh, in a dynamic basis. Plus payment systems, automated systems to write mailers, invite testers, select testers, all this has to be uh, very well knit in terms of technology. Enterprises can do it in uh, one of the three ways. They build their own technology and community. Some enterprises are uh, sort of outsourcing it and some are partnering it and working in a self-service model by engaging technology in some ways. These are two case studies. Uh, uh, one is a corporate website, just to give you an example. A uh, huge corporate website which was tested for six days, captured more than 320 defects. Uh, and this covered 47 different configurations and 16 countries and the 98% functional coverage. This is in six days. So three days preparation, six days testing. So over nine days, whole testing was over. Another one is uh, EMEA mobilization in five European countries. Uh, travel insurance application had to probably be tested on 15 different network carriers. So every country, three top mobile network carriers, it has to be tested. And this is something you could not do inside the test lab. So engaging, uh, you know, uh, five day of test execution to get 16 network carrier co coverage and uh, a good 38 per defects were captured. This is again more a performance related uh, defect uh, kind of testing and uh, five critical improvement suggestions coming in from the company. So I think that's all I have. Yeah, any other questions before I just wind up? have to work with some sort of partners who are doing offshoring to use private cloud as I said, or the organizations themselves use some private cloud. So the difference between offshoring and crowdsourcing is, crowdsourcing is going back to the customer location. Outsourcing is bringing work away from customer location, right? So if an application is to be deployed in five countries, you are actually, actually testing them in those five countries. So in terms of value, it is clear, but yes, the security concern, the IP concerns are there, which I said they are there. So a lot of companies, you know, they, they assess how far they can go. That is the reason why it is mostly used in the beta phase when the application is sort of ready. They don't have to expose their staging servers too much. No very restricted zone they can open up. We still use VPN connectivity, still use, you know, secure environments to provide uh, for mobile apps. So anyways, we use certain, uh, you know, specific uh, staging servers which are secure to, to do this. But yes, after a certain point, there is a risk and that is which is one of the biggest hindrances at this point. Otherwise, crowdsourcing would have prom I mean, probably grown much, much faster than anything. Yeah. I think it's getting uh, time is over. So maybe I'm here. So if there are any questions, we can talk one on one. Uh, Thank Session you. starting. Uh, this is a session by Mr. T. Ashok. So can we have Mr. Ashok on the dais, please? So uh, in the other session, we have a, a one and a half hours agile testing hackathon, which will start. and. Uh, it will continue till the end of the day. Whereas in this session, we'll be doing uh, transforming software test, uh, sorry, think better using descriptive prescriptive approach. And uh, after the kickoff break, second. 
we'll have the Indian Testing League finals here, which is a uh, corporate quiz contest to identify India's most knowledgeable software tester. So, a fun activity. Uh, Unicom doing in association with KPMG. So that's what will happen after the tea coffee. But before that, we have the fantastic presentation uh, from Mr. T. Ashok, founder and CEO of Stack Software. Uh, Stack Software is a boutique software, consult software testing and consulting firm. And the topic is there with you. Over to you, Mr. Ashok. Thank you, Nathan. You should be able to correlate. Well, I think my, my intent is to present things slightly different. So as you see the topic, you will be what the heck am I talking about? Am I going to talk, talk about something about doctors and prescription or storytelling and authors? And you're kind of right. It's about both of them. So what I'm really wanting to touch base on this is to look at a method of thinking that we typically use. And if we become a little more bad, how that will help what we do better? Can you just close that door if you don't mind? Thank you. Now, when we want to solve any problem, obviously in our context it's about quality, software, testing and stuff like that. That's the problem that we wish to solve. How do we design better? How do we strategize better? How do we understand better? How do we report better? These are all kind of quote unquote problems that we are trying to solve. And of course there are wide variety of solutions. <coughs> So whenever we want to understand, you know, when we want to solve a problem, a prerequisite is a good understanding. Ultimately, software testing is not about using your fingers. It's really about using your brains. It's really a far more interesting intellectual job. 